Father God, we thank you so much for this day, this cloudy day. <laughs> Lord, we pray that your presence would fill this place, Lord, that the cloud of your presence would be here, Lord. We want to feel your presence. We want to hear your voice, Lord. Pray that you would touch each person today in a special way, in a way that uh, we will go home and not forget what you've done in us, Lord. We want to encounter you today, Father God. Holy Spirit, come in this place. Reveal Jesus. Reveal the Father. Reveal the identity of each person in this place, the true identity, our kingdom of heaven identity. We want to walk in it, Lord. So raise us up. If anyone is, uh, is, is in the dirt right now spiritually, raise them up out of the dirt, Lord. Give us beauty for ashes this morning. Joy for heaviness. In Jesus' name, amen.
Bibles, uh, well, I have a bunch of verses. Where do we want to start? Start in like Luke chapter 1. Just put your fingers in there. So didn't Ember do a great job last Sunday? Come on. Wasn't that fun? All of you want to go to YWAM now. You're like, sign me up. Doesn't matter. I remember in my YWAM, um, in my second, I did two YWAM schools. I remember my second one, we had, everybody was in their mid-20s, and then we had one lady that was like 75. And I think she had as much spunk as anybody. It was awesome. She was amazing. Um, her, her husband had passed a year prior, and one of her dreams was always to travel and to go across the world and do something fun like that. And her husband was like, heck no. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's kind of a bummer, but... She, she did it after he passed, and, and they were married for over 50 years, and she just had, it's so cool to have that kind of uh, wisdom on the team. So if you're older, don't, don't let it go past you. They need you. Those young kids need, need some uh, wisdom in there, right? Yeah. It's good to have the different age groups, because the places in life that you've been is... It's so, it's so different, so it's always awesome to have multiple age groups. That's why I feel like revival, when people say revival's coming through, for the youth and through the youth only, I'm like, I think you're missing the kingdom aspect of that. Because kingdom says the revival is coming to those who say yes. Now, it's not that a youth can't start it, you know what I'm saying? But it's still God pouring out is for whoever says yes. And trust me, revival will never last with kids in charge. Do you hear me? There is a reason people need fathers and mothers. I, my kids would be dead from Skittle overdose <laughs> if they didn't have me to say no. Right? They don't, kids, the thing about kids is they, we want to be childlike, but then there's also this thing of wisdom that comes in and says, maybe I shouldn't eat this way because it's not healthy for me. <laughs> Amen. That's why God wants us to do revival as a family. He wants, for older people, don't grow hard. That's the thing you have to work on. Don't think you have it figured out. Don't think, well, God moved this way back then, so he'll do it this way again, because he won't. And if you're stuck in your ways, you'll miss the revival. But if you stay pliable, like uh, my wife always tells our kids, have a, always keep a soft and squishy heart. And I love that. And it's just good to remember, having a soft and squishy heart to be moved by the Lord. Um, but the last, the last two times I think I spoke, I was speaking about David, right? And I was speaking in the way, not just talking about David, but I was speaking in a way because God had given me a word a while back that we were moving from a, the church as a whole was in a Saul type of leadership structure and that God was wanting to move it to a David type leadership structure. And, when I, and I gave a bunch of examples about that through the life of Saul and the life of David. Saul was fearful of man. David was a fear of God. Saul cared more what people thought about him. David cared more about what God thought about him. And when you, have, when you have huge churches that aren't changing a nation, that's a Sauline type of leadership. It's turned into a spectator sport. A lot of Christianity has turned into a spectator sport where people come, they, it, and it's more like an AA type of meeting instead of a mission meeting of making warriors and sending them out. Is that making sense to you guys? 
Like when we're based around humans' needs, if human, it's not like our needs aren't important at some level, right? Because if you're married, you kind of want that person to help some of those needs, right? There's certain needs that God made a man and a wife to meet for one another, right? And you lean into each other's strengths, and you honor one another's strengths and weaknesses. You cover their weaknesses, and you, you use your strengths. Usually, with, I know me and my wife, my strengths are not her strengths. And then her strengths are not my strengths, so we work really well together. And there's times when she'll look at me and be like, uh, this is not your strength. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm going to lean into you on this one. I'm going to honor the gifting God's put in your life, and I'm going to lean into you and turn my ear your direction and put a hand up to my direction, right? I'm going to humble myself. Like, See, the thing about kingdom and stuff is honor has to be at the core of everything you do. Because if you're only a my way or the highway person, good luck. Good luck, because God doesn't work with those people. You will be able to accomplish only what human strength can accomplish. But one of the things in the kingdom, and I think that one of the reasons why revival hasn't lasted for generations a lot of the time is because of, actually, uh, the Lord spoke to this to me a long time ago, because when I was studying revival, typically it lasts five to seven years, and then put peters out. Even three sometimes, not even five sometimes. And it can peter out. You guys know that? And one of the reasons I believe that has been the case, and one of the things that God spoke to me is because the church hasn't honored women in the correct positions. Got really quiet. (laughs) Where most, one of the things that a lot of times God starts asking me questions. When I ask him a question, sometimes he'll, he like talks to me in question form. And I, I always think that's interesting. So I was asking him that question, why don't revivals last? And so um, as I was, I was reading, actually, if any of you are interested in revival history, there is a book called Revival. Not history, just revival. By Winky Prattney. There is a New Zealander guy named Winky Prattney. He was, a, he was very closely related with YWAM for many years. He wasn't necessarily a part of YWAM, but he was a prophet for YWAM. And he's a prophet throughout the world. I believe he's passed on either that or he's probably over 100 at this point. Because when I was in YWAM, he was really old. And, I remember, and he had so much energy. It was awesome. He was like in his late 80s. So he was already way up there in age, and then I think he lived for quite a while longer, but he, he was an amazing speaker and a really gifted in the prophetic. But he wrote this, he says it's compiled by Winky Prattney. He doesn't say written by Winky, because he actually takes so much um, actual written uh, history from other people's writings that he just says he compiled the book. Does that make sense? So you read, and he goes through every revival in that from the 1700s, 1600s, and on. And it's really interesting. As I read that book, it was a really good all-around book for those things. And, I, and God's like, after reading that book, God, God was like, well, how many women were in charge of those? Or how many women were in leadership in, in the, any of those revivals did you hear about? How many women names did you read? It's like, mm, I don't know if I remember hardly any. He's like, well, what's uh, one of the men's weaknesses? It's like my way or the highway mentality. Men tend to value being right over relationship. Tend to. Not all men. Yeah, and I've, I'm learning as I lean into your wife, as you lean into the womanly side, you learn that what a woman is the only person on the planet that can really make a house a home. You can say I'm being stereotypical, but it's true. Have you ever been to a bachelor pad? Have you ever been into one bachelor pad where you're like, mm, it smells nice in here. <laughs> it's inviting. Look at this. Look at these decorations. Look at this. Like my mom was putting candles in a porta john. Yeah, the candles aren't lit because my mom is gone. She's in Hawaii. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, poor mom. Um, 
No, but she's probably going to watch this, so <laughs> we're just jealous. Okay, so, um, but, right, like, the, the woman comes alongside and she nourishes. Does, I just see how Chrissy nourishes the children in a certain ways. And then I, I've so seen so clearly how I am gifted in different ways with the kids. That's called the fear of the Lord. Actually, I've noticed that discipline is a gifting of the father, yeah. not the mother. And so those of you who are single moms probably know how hard it is to try to discipline your kids because when you don't have a father figure in the house, there's just something about that picture. It's not that a mom can't discipline because God's grace is enough for you wherever you're at. You hear me? But in general, I do believe there's a gifting on the father for that discipline side. And I've noticed that kids, my kids respond completely different to me when I discipline them than when Christy does. And so there's different, there, you know, the thing is, our whole world is trying to get rid of the roles, but we were created differently. What the world forgets is they forget honor. We need people to be different. We need you to be who you were created to be. We need, we were both created in the image of God, man and woman, but there is a, I think there's half of God's heart and half of God's heart. And without working together, we never get the full picture. And one of the things that I feel really strongly about, uh, cause, because this is what I believe God laid on my heart, he said, women are more, they much, in a natural way, they much more greater value relationship over being right. Like, they would rather hold on to the relationship than to be right and cause discord. And everything I've read about revival history, it's the man who's, they eventually get mad at each other, start arguing about theology part ways, and the revival goes, Pfft. or money becomes an issue. Just different things become an issue. And they're like, and there's something about that side where God's like, I want you to value relationship more than you value just being right about the, every little thing. You know, the making a house a home, it, so I believe because revival hasn't been sustained for the generations is because of the womanly side and leadership being out of the mix. Is that making sense? Because for revival to last, it has to be a family. You have to turn from a business to a home at some point. Is that making sense? You can't be all business and expect to make it for generations. There has to be connection. There has to be relationship because men have always tended to eventually break apart. I'm going my way. I'm going my way. I don't even know why I was talking about that. We are talking about revival, obviously. And the roles. And, and so the thing is, one of the things that the world has done that I've noticed is there's, they've, they've, how many of you have noticed that they've been trying to put women in seats of higher authority positions? But what I've also noticed is like there, it's kind of like this thing. It's like if you want to be here, you have to change and look like a man to be in this position. Have you noticed that? Like you got to wear a power suit, power tie, and Act like a CEO if you want to be the CEO here. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, we want you to be in leadership, but you have to act like a man. And that's not going to work. It's not going to work. You can try all you want. It's like, it's like wearing the Saul's armor. It's like, this doesn't fit. And the thing is, the real essence of the problem is that the actual... Create, who God created woman to be has not been honored yet. That's the issue. Not truly honored. I mean, I see how much of the world today that being a mom at home is the loser job. And it's devalued by women. By activist women. They devalue being a mom. You know why? Because they couldn't hack it. There is not a harder job on the planet than that. And we devalue it. I see what my wife does, and I'm like, I would, I almost said shoot myself in the head, but I just said it. Um, like, 
her having to be there every day, doing the same stuff with the kids every day, saying the same thing over and over every day, cleaning up diapers every day, being a milk factory every day. I mean, they got kids hanging on her, drinking off of her. Like, I'm like, oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for making me a man. I mean, my part in the whole thing, I mean, it was just something that I got to do um, that I think, I mean, it's just, you know, one of those things, you know, that I think about all the time and I got to do that. So, I mean, I really put some sweat into it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When she was giving birth and I was freaking out. Um, well, I actually did deliver almost all of my kids which was super fun. There is not a slipperier substance on the planet than a baby. <laughs> a good thing they're small, because, I mean, you could be like, boom! They're like, like a lemon seed or something, you know, like those lemon seeds. Like, if I squeeze, they're going to shoot through the window. Like, it's like, no. Now, if we could duplicate that lubricant for stuff, come on. God, God is awesome, right? And I've seen, like, Christy, I've seen her. So here, here's the thing. Like, when we wrestle and if we mess around and stuff like that, now, some women are, like, I had a sister that liked wrestling and being more rough. Christy hates it. She's like, I'm not your sister, you know, if I pick on her or, like, do brotherly stuff. How many of you women love it when your husbands act like brothers? No? <laughs> okay. Um, if I start picking on her and doing these weird little things, she like, she's like, get off of me. I'm not your sister. So I've learned how to have to, you know, treat her differently because I was raised with sisters thinking, I know how to treat women. I have two sisters. Mm hmm Totally different. Yeah. And so, but... So I used to think, like, she's kind of a sissy. In my head, I'm just being vulnerable here, church. Like, she's kind of a sissy about stuff. And when we were, she was going to have her first baby, I was a little worried. I mean, I barely, like, grab her, and she's like, ow. And I'm like, this is not looking good for you. Because what I've heard is childbirth is pretty intense. Now, obviously, this was an internal monologue that never became external because I didn't want to die. So I was just thinking it. And then when, we, when I got to have the, see, when I got to be there, we had a midwife come to our house and we had our baby in a field. And um, just kidding. <laughs> People think, like, you had a midwife? That's weird. We didn't have the baby in the attic, we had the baby in the bed. So just, it's all good. It's actually a lot nicer. I've, we've had our babies in three different locations. We've had two at home. Uh, we had the twins at the hospital, and we had our other baby at a midwifery clinic in Indonesia. So we've had quite the gamut of experiences. And the one in Indonesia was the nicest because it was open air and mosquitoes could come in. So that was awesome. Um, but... Yeah, so, but I remember the first, our first was Amelia, and um, we had the midwife come over, and she was, we had taken the class together, you know, where I help her, co coach her, or whatever, coach her. Yeah, good job, honey. <laughs> Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> remember to breathe so you don't pass out. <laughs> Let me rub your hips there. Come on, baby. Um, so anyway, so we're, we're doing this thing, and, and I remember seeing her, like, and the first baby, those of you who've had lots of babies know that usually the first one takes the shortest. Okay, okay, I'm just making sure you're listening. The first one usually takes the longest. I know for our babies, it was like, like uh, what was Amelia? Was she 17 or 19 hours? 19 hours. So Amelia, from, you know, where she went into labor, and 
you know, it, it ended up taking a long time. And I remember just seeing Christy go through that. And we would walk down the driveway while she was, and she would have a contraction and put her hands on my neck. And then I would hold her and just encourage her. And then she, we'd walk a little bit because we were trying to get the baby to move more and, and go further into a labor. And so I got to see this different side of my wife that I had never seen before. And then it came down um, to the ring of fire. And it's called, is that transition? Is that what that's called? Yeah. I'm trying to remember. It's been a little while, so forgive me. But when, when the woman goes into transition, and it's like, that's kind of like when you know what hits the fan. You just stepped into battle. Like, you were shooting arrows before, but now you're like hand-to-hand -hand combat time. That's kind of how I view it. And, um, and I saw something so different come out of my wife. Like, no, she, yeah, the baby. But the baby wasn't out yet. I saw her click into a gear that I have never seen before. It's like from deep down inside of her, this strength came up. And I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> like, it's already been like 18 and a half hours. It's like, I would be exhausted. I'd be like, oh, can we watch a show? Is football on? Give me some peanuts. <laughs> like, I'm done. I give up. Give me an epidural and take the baby out. <laughs> right? Like, and, and she just kept going and kept going. And she clicked into this gear. And I just saw her like, no, it's, I'm going. And it's like, I was like, whoa. <laughs> Who are you? No, I wasn't scared. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And then, so she worked, and eventually, obviously, Amelia came, and I, I was able to catch her, which was the hardest part. Um, <laughs> and, and, like, yeah, and then, the, I mean, I had emotions that I had never felt before. For those of you who first held your first child, you can't, you can't explain those emotions because you've never had them before. It was like this crazy overwhelming joy and, or, and overwhelming, like I was crying and giggling at the same time. It was, I've never quite, you know what I'm saying? Like it was just like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know if I can replicate it for you, but I was like, it was just like the, I don't know, you know how they say to have the awe of the Lord? I think that's pretty close. It's like total honest. Like, you're just like, overwhelmed, undone. Like, you don't know, you just can't expect, like, the love is pouring out of your heart and all this stuff is going on. But the coolest thing for me was when, you know, obviously I didn't hold the baby for very long. The midwife came, wiped it really quick, and then just set it at Chris, on, on Christy's stomach and her bosom. This is the bosom. On her bosom. And I just remember, like, watching her go through and all that crazy pain, and it was like it was gone in an instant. As soon as the baby was on her chest, and she just, I just heard her like, my baby, my baby, my baby. And there's this look on her face of every time that that happens that you probably remember. The look on the mother's face, it's just like, and there's just like all these endorphins are being, or what's it called? What's that? Um, all those things get released for the bonding with the baby, oxytocins and stuff like that that God did. That was just awesome. And I just, what I saw right then was like, this woman ain't no sissy. Yeah. Right? Like there's, and then what our God was showing me is there's different kinds of strengths. Yes, your wife is not going to get into it in cage fighting. But she is strong as, as, as she, but she's as strong as any man on the planet. If there's just different strengths. Honor those strengths. And one of the things I've learned to honor about Christy is I grow, I grow unsettled and I, I get unsettled quickly. And she helps me steward the patience and the sticking it out for the long haul. And then I help her having a crazy adventurous life. Because I'm like, I want to go here. Let's do this. 
She's like, okay, I want to heal the sick and raise the dead. And she's like, I want to raise my kids to be revivalists. Yeah, that too. That too. Right? And there's just, there's different strengths. And when honor is in the mix, you see, that's what has to happen in our church too. Honor's got to be in the mix for us to grow. Honor's got to be in the mix for us to go further with what God has for us. See, David, one thing I think that's interesting about David and Saul that was different is you never hear about Saul's mighty men. But you hear about David's. Because David was someone, I believe, that created relationship with a core group of people that were willing to lay down their lives for one another. I believe Saul was a man of uh, just short term, as long as it was working for him. He was like the dating relationship, and David was like the covenant relationship. See, in a dating relationship, the reason why marriage is such a big deal is because in dating relationships, even if you're being intimate, it can't, it's not the same. It can't be because it's all based on manipulation because you've never said, I'm all in forever for you. That's covenant. Does that make sense? And see, for church... For our church to be healthy and to grow, we have to get rid of dating and grab hold of covenant at some point. See, you date at first, right? We all, you're not just going to jump into a covenant. This ain't bachelor. We know those relationships last forever. They got the prenup before it even starts. Let's plan the divorce before we get married. I have a good feeling about this. <laughs> I'm going to plan my escape plan before I even get in. <laughs> That's not having a covenant relationship either. Because in the mind, you've never actually given your heart to that person. You've never said, I do forever. And there's a difference. See, I believe Saul had that dating relationship because he was in it as long as it was good for him. And that's one of the biggest differences. Because people use manipu the manipulation of leaving to get what their needs, what their needs are met. Is that making sense? Like, I'm in this, but I can always go out. Like, people are like, why do I need to get married and screw it up? How many of you have ever heard that one? <laughs> it's like, well, you'll never know what a covenant relationship is until you have a wholehearted yes. Amen? And everything about God, did he do everything he did, every relationship he made with man was a covenant because he's a covenant God. Every time he says something, he's like, here are the standards. I'm all in forever. I will never fail. I will never go back on this promise. All my promises were yes and amen in Jesus Christ, and I will never go away from them. Ever. 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 Come on, that's, like, that's how our God is. So if we want to grow, if we want to see revival sustained, if we want to see life and joy and peace and hope be filling our lives, we have got to grab hold of the covenant relationship with God and with one another. Covenant, saying, I'm in. I'm not in until I get angry. I'm not in until someone hurts me. Because you know what? Someone's going to in this space. And when you come in with your backdoor plan already planned out, guess where you're going to go when, those, when trouble comes, when hurt comes? Because everybody, last time I checked, no one's perfect. No one says everything perfectly. No one does everything perfectly with people. But there is something that shifts when you say, I'm all in in this brotherhood. I mean, I think about it like, Think about the relationship that David had with Jonathan, right? I mean, think about this. The kind of, this tells you what kind of person David was and what kind of person Jonathan was. That Jonathan loved David so much that he, was complete, he saw God's calling on him. Like, Jonathan is the perfect picture of honor to me. Like, he saw the calling of God on his best friend and gave up his own rights as being king. And he would have served David his whole life had he not died in battle. 
And he, like, he knew God had anointed him king, and he, he never tried to, I mean, he wasn't entitled. See, you can't have honor and entitlement. They don't work together. And see, God is just doing this, like, he wants to, us to see this, like, to get out of this place. I'm going to be at this church as long as my needs are met. I'm going to go find a place that is, I'm going to have my little checkbox of all the things that I want from a church. Is there services an hour? <laughs> nope. <laughs> right? Like there's, there's just different things that happen in a church setting and that what we've, and because of leadership turning it into a business model, Right? What's business based on? It's based on service. Providing a service so that you get a profit. Keeping people happy so you get a profit. Making people's lives better so you get a profit. So actually, the heart of some of the things in business aren't that bad, right? A good business should make the, the lives of people better in their area because they provide a service at a good price to make their lives better and easier, Right? But that's not what the kingdom of God and the church is supposed to be. Not that we don't want to make people's lives better, but you can't make someone's life, the things of the kingdom to gain character and to gain um, trust in the Lord and to grow in faith don't come from making people happy a lot of the time. They come from being willing to get in there and say the hard things, to dig deep, to be vulnerable from past pains, and to reach deep inside of yourself and say, hey, this is me. And you're going to, at some point, have to be vulnerable enough to risk everything with your spouse in a covenant relationship. And yet, at some point, you're going to have to be vulnerable. If you want healing and want to walk in healing and want to walk free, at some point, you're going to have to be vulnerable enough in this place with somebody else to get inner healing in those places. To say, you're going to have to, at some point, risk saying, this is me, and they might hate me because of what I'm about to show them. And I remember when Christy and I, and this is a lot of times before you enter a covenant, when you're just in the dating phase, some of you are just still dating us here at Recalibrate. And that's fine. I think you should. You don't want to just jump right in because God always says, count the cost. Where are they going, right? Count the cost before you say yes to me. I'm not saying me. Jesus said that. But yeah, you should because I'm a little crazy. And our team's a little crazy. We love the Holy Spirit, and we're going to go regardless. And we're going to make mistakes on that journey, and then we're going to correct them because we're going to walk in humility. Amen? And you're going to keep, we're going to, it's kind of like that flight plan. I've, I've said this many times. Do like, you know an airplane's off of the flight plan like 90% of the time? Winds are blowing it, but it, the, it always corrects back to the flight plan. And I'm not talking about moral failure. I'm talking about, hey, we did some. We could have done that better. I could have listened to Holy Spirit. I had a little bit of fear to step out in that. Next time, I'm going to be more bold, right? Like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have given that person the mic because they just made a big mess. <laughs> but you're like, oh, well, God's not angry at us. He's like, oh, we can grow from that. If I have a check in my spirit about something, I'll listen to it next time. You hear me, church? Like, so there's these things, like you can grow in these things. And I remember before Christy and I got married, you know, we'd been dating for a, a little while and we kind of, we, we were being very serious. I remember I sat down with her and told her everything I had done. Now see, <laughs> it was a three ring binder. Not everything I had ever done, but like one thing I did not want to happen was for me to ever be hanging out with some old buddies and then them say something and Christy's like, what? <laughs> right? And I knew she wasn't marrying the old man. She was marrying the man I had said yes to with Jesus. Yeah. Amen? 
And I knew she wasn't judging me for that, but I had to date her for a while to, be, to even come to that place. Does that make sense? So Gwen was talking two weeks, two weeks ago, right? Two weeks ago about like inner healing, right? You cannot have inner healing without vulnerability. And vulnerability is not the same as openness. Openness is the very beginning stage of vulnerability. See, I can do something or have a mistake, mess up with something, and then I go and deal with it with the Lord. I go deal with it in my own life and all that kind of stuff. And then I I get God's healing and I get figured out. And then I go and tell Justin about that. That's being open, not vulnerable. Hello? Oh, wow. That was weird. But not vulnerable. I just entered a cave. Now I'm back out. So that's being open because I have already dealt with everything. I'm not truly showing him. I mean, I'm showing him a picture of me, but I'm not showing him that vulnerable side of my heart. Does that make sense? Now, if I am being tempted with something, right in the middle of getting ready to like choose this, let's say, alternate path that God doesn't want me to choose, and then I call him, and I'm like, hey, man, I'm really struggling, and I'm really actually wanting to do this right now. I need you to pray with me. That's vulnerability. Because that's in a place where I'm weak right there. That's in a place where I'm like, I'm, I'm like a little animal getting ready to get trapped. Like I'm vulnerable to a trap coming and I'm reaching out to my brother for strength or I'm reaching out to my wife for strength. And one of the things that I'm learning as a man is that we are not great at vulnerability. At least I'm not. Like to, because vulnerability takes an EQ. You know what that is? Emotional intelligence. I have an actually a decent IQ I did really well in school, but if, if school was rated on an EQ, I would have failed multiple grades. I can help other people emotionally, but when it comes to Chrissy going, what's going on with you? I'm fine. Fine is the word of the day. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm fine. I'm good. You got a lot going on in your life. How are you handling the stress? I'm fine. And then I'll do something and mess up or I'll blow up about something stupid and start hurting the lawnmower or <laughs> something really dumb. And Chrissy's like, oh, you're fine. Where'd that come from? My fineness. Right? And it's not being emotion, it's not having that emotional IQ because what I was, I don't know about you guys, but in, in the culture that I was raised in, you just ignored your emotions and stuffed them down. And you got up and you did what you needed to do and never took care of it. How many of you grew up like that? Like you were, no one was like, I just remember like even like if I was really upset about something, you know, and I'm working at this because I'm bad about it with my own kids. It's like, you know, when kids cry about silly things, like we think they're silly. But instead of going, hey, you know, instead of just helping them, like what's going on in your heart and then teaching them, well, how can we react in a different way than that? Instead of just being like, hey, stop crying. Well, I want this. That's dumb. Stop it. Right? That's how I was raised. I, I remember, sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I, but how, how many of you were raised that way? Let's just be honest. Like a lot of us, right? Like you just, you, there's no place for that. You don't learn how to deal with your emotions, so you just learn to bury them, and then we wonder why we have these walls with God. You know why? Because you've never let anybody in there. You won't even let yourself in there. Yeah, but it seems like the liar gets in there a lot, because hidden places are an attraction to darkness. And, and one of the things I've known, like, I remember when I, um, I played baseball all growing up, and I was, always, I was always a natural at sports. 
except for ping pong. But um, actually, I was really good at ping pong. But no, um, I was always really good in sports. I was a natural athlete, and I played shortstop and uh, pitched all growing up in baseball. And we lived in Florida, so we played baseball year round. So baseball was really important to me. And I remember when I was about, I don't know, I'll make it younger so I don't sound as bad. Um, I, I'm trying to remember. It was Little League. I know it was Little League. I was probably 10 to 12 in that range. And I remember I was always the leadoff hitter because I, I was always the fastest guy on the team. So, and I was a good hitter, so I would lead off because they wanted me to, you know, I, always, I had the best on-base percentage or whatever. And this game, I struck out four times in a row. Just a really off game. And after the fourth time of striking out, I started crying right there on the field, right there. I took my helmet, chucked it up against the fence, threw my bat up against the fence, ran on the bench and cried. <laughs> and my coach kept me on the bench and didn't let me come back out on the field. He was an older guy, and which he, if I was a coach, I would have done the same thing. You're benched. Um, so I sat on the bench, and then on our way home, me and Dad were riding in the car, dead silence. Which is awkward <laughs> when you've just done something like that. Because you know what your father's thinking about. He is unhappy with me. He's really disappointed in me, right? And you, I'm sure you've had, you might not have had this exact experience, but you've probably had one similar to it. And um, I remember we pulled into the driveway, pulled into the garage, and Dad just looks over at me, and he said, you will never, ever do that again. And that was it. Did that teach me how to work on my emotions? Right? And I'm not saying my dad had a bad heart about it or anything like that, but I'm saying like there's those times in your life where you just learn, I need to bury this. And when those feelings start coming back up, you know, I remember playing, football was a great outlet for me because you can hit people. <laughs> so... I got to take those frustrations and hit somebody. Now, today, I'd probably get in more trouble. <laughs> but um, they're a little more strict on that kind of stuff. But back when I played, you could just run people over wherever. Um, and, and I didn't know, like, so whenever those circumstances come up, you're like, you wonder why you fall in, you start, I mean, there are certain areas of my life I wondered why, why do I keep struggling in these sins, the same thing over and over and over again? How many of you found that you've been in patterns before, right? And when you get in these patterns, and it like, when you mess up, it like, it doesn't even make sense to you. Like, why? Why would I just do that? I wasn't even hardly tempted, and I just did it, right? Have you ever asked that question? Like, why would I just do it? Like, I, like the enemy doesn't even have to try in this area for some reason. I just fall into this, and I don't even know why, and... You know, we all have our different areas or whatever they might be. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about every sin issue. I'm just talking about the heart of it here today. And one of the things I've noticed is like, like how do I expect to walk in healing when every part of the emotional um, things that come my way or the things that are tough, I just bury them. And I've never actually learned to go, hear God, because I think he's going to look at me and say, I'm disappointed in you. Your emotions are stupid. Right? It's really quiet in here. Am I making sense? Like, I'm, my dad never actually said that to me, but the, the, that's what I took from it. Your emotions aren't valuable, so just bury them and act like they don't exist and control yourself. Right? But then you, if you let those things build up, like there is a father who is safe. And I, most of yours weren't. I actually don't know of many fathers that are great in this area. And I'm working on it because, Chrissy, a lot of times, 
she's been working with me on this because she notices that, that I do that same pattern. You go after, yeah, and I have four girls. So I'll, I better learn this one. All right? And even justice is really sensitive, I've noticed. And I will quench. I will quench his sensitivity, sensitivity to the spirit of God if I don't learn how to honor that and teach him how to steward it instead of acting like it doesn't exist. And it's funny, you know, I, I meet all these, you know, being on the job site, I meet all these tough guys. They are the biggest pansies on the planet when it comes to emotions. <laughs> and the only reason you act tough is because you're scared to death little kid to let anybody in. To let anybody to that vulnerable place because you've been wounded since you were a kid, most of us, and so we just put a big wall up. And instead of throwing tamper tantrums, which some do still, or, or instead of crying on the job site, <laughs> I cut the board wrong. No. Um, so <laughs> that wouldn't go over well, right? So you have to, it's like, we learn that there's only one emotion that's okay as a man. It's anger. Yeah. So everything makes us mad. It's because we're big sissies emotionally. I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong on this. Trust, and I'm talking to me, so just hear me out. Because we've never learned that. We've been wounded by our dad. We've been wounded by different people. We've been wounded by coaches. We've been all of these kind of things. And women, you're no different. I can't speak for women because I've never been one. <laughs> but I do know that there is something very special about the connection between a father and a daughter. I know there's something crazy that, that I am called to give my daughters that only I can give her them. There is something about the security and safety that I know they feel every time they come and rest on my bosom, crawl up into my lap. They're crying about different things like outfits and stuff. <laughs> she wanted to wear the same color as me. Stop it. That's dumb. <laughs> Instead of, right? Is it making sense? Yeah. So a lot of you were still raised in that, a lot of you women were raised in that same place where your emotions weren't given value. And a lot of your mothers didn't know how to do it. And so we're wondering why we're in these same places when our emotional basket that we keep hiding, it's like that one place in our life that we keep throwing stuff and eventually it overflows. It's going to come out in some way. Now, a lot of people like, I mean, on the job site with people I deal with, most of them have drinking problems because that's, that's the outlet. And then that doesn't fix anything. That just actually gives them a bigger thing to hold it all in. And then it ends up being such a big burden that they do things. It's like, why do we have Christians that commit suicide? Why do we have Christians that are so overwhelmed by life? It's like because they, they can sing praises to God. Their hearts love Jesus. You guys all love Jesus, right? We love him, but we've actually barred him out of a super awesome place in our hearts. And that emotional place, that deep vulnerability. Are you actually being vulnerable with him? And I'm, I'm thinking like, how many times do I go to the Lord in a quiet time and I'm like, you know, teach me something, Lord. And God's like, no, share something with me. I want to know. about. It's like, well, you already know everything, Lord, so I don't have to figure it out. But then you still lack that closeness if you don't share it. 
Is this making sense to you guys? And I believe that God wants us to be so healthy, so free. And he wants us to learn this thing and wants us to figure out what this covenant relationship means to walk in a place of total trust and vulnerability with him and also with one another. To believe the best about one another. To give one another the benefit of the doubt. How many of you appreciate your heart being judged? Nobody does. Because it's a, that's a really touchy subject. So there's times when like I've heard things about other leaders or other people from other people, and I'm like, no, that's not. Like, I've, heard, I've had people tell me stuff about Justin sometimes. This has happened since I've known him, and I'm sure you've heard the same about me. And I'm like thinking like they don't know him. He, he didn't mean it. I can tell him he didn't mean it that way. Right? And it's like that's what, that's what family looks like. And no, I know his heart. And you might have taken it that way, and I'm sorry you took it that way, but I can promise you Justin didn't mean that. Because I know his heart. He wouldn't do that. Right? And that's just kind of that's what comes with that intimacy. That's what comes with close friends. That's what comes when you learn someone else's heart, but you got to be open and vulnerable with somebody. Amen? I always say open and vulnerable because open is the first step. Vulnerability is, is where the real growth happens. Does that make sense to you guys? Well, I didn't talk about anything I was going to today. God must have definitely had different plans. <laughs> No, it's, I don't know, there's, one thing you will figure out about me is I have to talk about something close to the heart. I have to talk about something that God is doing, and this is an ongoing thing with me that I know I have to grow in. And I know we as a church have to grow in. Because if we're going to move into a place where we, if, I mean, we talk about the glory of God coming, the presence of God coming. If we don't have close relationships, we will not know how to steward it. It's kind of like a relationship where neither partner is fully committed and they go through a hard situation. Or they go through a heavy situation. How do you think that's going to work? They're going to bail. Right? And the thing about hard situations is when you're in it and you're committed and you're in covenant with that person, it actually expands and grows the relationship more than any other circumstance could. And there's things with the Lord. There's weight. God, you know, another word for glory is weightiness. It's heavy sometimes. God does deep things. He's not interested in the fluff. He's not interested in you looking good on Sunday and praising and worshiping good. He's interested in the depths of your heart being cleansed and whole and connected to his. Amen? And that's, I think, one of the things about Recalibrate, what we're going for, that this is like a super huge core value for us. Because what does it matter if you come to church and get all excited but never change? What does it really matter? Like, to me, God should look like something. A relationship with the most powerful being in the universe should look like something. When he says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed, he wasn't lying. So if I'm walking in the same struggle, I want to know what's going on. And the thing about God is sometimes he won't even reveal it to you. He'll reveal it to somebody else to, who will help you. Is this, come on, follow me. Because he wants us to be in relationship. He didn't even have to create humans. We were created for relationship. We were created to be with him. That He, could, he wanted to see the planet become the kingdom's. That's why he's like, I want to partner with someone. How crazy is that? I mean, he even had John the Baptist baptize the Son of God. Like, what part of partaking of in glory is that? 
And think about John's perspective in that. I am baptizing the Son of God. Like this is the, but that's who God is. It's like there's just this crazy connection and partnership that he wants to do it in. And he wants to set you free. Hear me, church. He wants to heal your mind, your body, your will. He wants to, like when he says that we're a new creation, he wants to make everything new. He wants to heal every thing that triggers you in certain areas. He wants to get, he knows what's behind there, but he won't actually show you unless you seek it out. That's the one thing I've noticed. How many of you have noticed that inner healing doesn't come fr- cheaply? It's a free gift of God, but it does not come cheap. There is risk. There is exposure. There is vulnerability required. Amen? And I think some of the spectator side of church is because of people. Because we're like, I'm unwilling to go there. And I promise you we're going to chase lots of people away by being vulnerable. Because some people just aren't ready to go there. I was just in this. I just wanted to make out a little bit. I didn't want kids and stuff. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I didn't want to get into my pocketbook or anything. Like, this is starting to cost too much. I'm going to go somewhere else. You hear what I'm saying? I ain't talking about money, literally. Like, this is costing me something. I'm having to expose myself, and everything life has showed me is when I expose myself, I get hurt. And we are awesome at self protection. Hi, what? You want to say something? Okay. Uh oh. No, it's going to be good. Um, well, you walked up. Now I lost the train of thought because you're so hot. <laughs> no, but we are so good at self-protection. And one of the things that I've noticed is actually self-protection is a, I believe it's a demonic spirit because it only leads to bondage. And when I look at the fruit of it, it only leads to bondage. So it can't be, it's not of God because last time I checked, he, we're supposed to be in the shadow of his wing, not our own. And God is wanting to heal every trigger. He's wanting to heal every deep wounding that anyone has ever done to you. To where you, he's not asking you to fully trust every human being. He's asking you to fully trust him first. Just in the beginning, you guys can close your eyes because I don't want you to stare at me. Um, no, in the beginning, Justin, he made this comment that he slammed his hand down. I guess you can open your eyes like this. And he said, this is who God is in covenant. And it's like right when he did that, the Lord just showed me this picture of like, he already knows everything. He knows everything about us. You know, he knows what we struggle with. He knows the past. He knows what we're thinking right now. Like, and Justin said, this is who he chooses to be. I'm faithful. You know, like he's provider. He's healer. He's, I mean, he's everything that we need. And I was just sitting there thinking, gosh, how often do we, Choose not to come and lean into him for fear that he will reject us when we come. And yet he's already made that line in the sand saying, this is who I have chosen to be. I can be no different. And so I just felt like just this weightiness. I don't know if you guys felt that, but that covenant with the father is like you come in and you reveal to him the pieces of your heart that are just 
they're broken, they're the beautiful things, the broken things, the shattered things. The, and he says, this is who I am. I never have to turn my face from that. There is nothing too icky. There is nothing too messy. Like, he's like, I've already dealt with this. <laughs> so every time you come to him, I just feel like he's saying there's a solution. There's no longer a, I'm disappointed in you. I just feel him being like, this is who I am so that you come. This is who I am so I can restore and redeem and repurpose. Like, I just get this Pinterest picture in my head of like repurposing old crap. You know, it's like there's, you can do so much with it. And God is like, he's the DIY, you know, like every situation you bring to him, he makes it beautiful. Like there's just nothing you can bring to him that he can't make amazing. Period. Like he already said that he would. He said, this is the line in the sand. I choose not to look at whatever it is that you've done because I already told you that I dealt with it. I just feel like right now the Lord is, he just really wants to rest. If you could just close your eyes and I just saw the Father coming, Holy Spirit coming. Jesus is, he's here and He's just wrapping his arm around each person saying, what is it? What do you need me to say? I just feel like he's saying, I'm such a good, good father. I'm such a good, good father. And this is a place, this is a home, and this is a house where the Father's words are going to be glorified, where the Father's actions are going to be glorified, where you will come and you will receive healing. I just feel like the Father is just like, I'm tired of the church. I'm tired of the church turning my children away when I'm choosing to look at them in the eye. I see you. And there is nothing like his love. Father, we just open our hands to you right now. We open our hearts and we just say that we just want to fall in love with you. We want you in every fiber of our being. We want you to blow through every area of our soul and revive us. And I feel like someone needs to hear today that it's just not that big of a deal. <laughs> There's just nothing too big for him. Um, my grandmother used to see angels and she would tell me when I was little that they were 25 feet tall. And the reason I say that is the bigness of our God. <laughs> he, create, he created the angelic to come and surround this place and, and to release his his presence to be felt and, and we're, you know, these angels came to Mary and Joseph in these situations in the Bible where there are these angels and people were afraid and God says, come to me, all who are weary. 
not to a 25, 30 foot angel, like that, that is the fear, but even more so to the Lord. And he says, I see you. I didn't feel the weightiness on that. Like, I see you. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of your stuff. I just feel like we're supposed to sit here for a minute. And I feel like God is just going to give some of us just an answer for some of the emotional hard stuff that we've been dealing with. I was just going to um, say something really quickly. I got this picture of the father coming and sitting next to me. And he sat right here, about a foot from me. And I was like, that's weird. Why didn't he sit right next to me? And he's like, Christy, that still makes you uncomfortable. I was just being vulnerable. That still makes you uncomfortable. But I heard the Lord say, I'm moving in. Church, I'm moving in. And I'm going to come closer and I'm going to come closer because I love you. And eventually I'm going to wrap my arm around you. And it's not going to feel weird. Because some of us didn't have a dad that didn't wrap their arm around him and say, Good job. You're beautiful. I'm proud of you. That was funny when you did that and fell on your face. You know, and I just feel like he, he's saying, like, I'm moving in. Get ready. So, Holy Spirit, we just say yes to you moving in. We say yes to your presence. We say yes to coming and, and making us whole. You've already said that it's done, but Lord, we invite you. It's our turn to invite you and say, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Yeah, I just, everyone's, you can sit or you can stand, but I was just going to just close us out in prayer. God, we just release the beauty of your covenant in this house. That you would reveal to us the covenant you have with us. And the blessing and the fruit and the hope and the life that it brings. Which is why we are different from any other people group. that Christians are marked with covenant. They are marked with peace. We pray that today there would be a marking. We thank you, Father, that your spirit is in this place. that the mothers and the fathers of this house are praying that all would come to know the love of God. And Jesus, we just say yes to you. Holy Spirit, we say yes to you. We say yes to your pursuit. And Father, we say yes to your pursuit of our hearts. And we thank you that you loved us first and that we don't have to be afraid because you're so, so good. Yeah, thank you, Jesus.